A Scarlet Letter by Nathaniel Hawthorne From Stream Books Roman 21 The New England Holiday The times in the morning of the day on which the new governor was to receive his office at the hands of the people. Hester Prynne and Little Pearl came into the marketplace. It was already thronged with the craftsmen and other plebeian inhabitants of the town, in considerable numbers, among whom, likewise, were many rough figures, whose attire of deerskins marked them as belonging to some of the forest settlements which surrounded the little metropolis of the colony. On this public holiday, as on all other occasions, for seven years past, Hester was clad in a garment of coarse gray cloth, not more by its hue than by some indescribable peculiarity in its fashion. It had the effect of making her fade personally out of sight and outline. While, again, the scarlet letter brought her back from this twilight indistinctness, and revealed her under the moral aspect of its own illumination. Her face so long familiar to the town's people. It was like a mask, or, rather, like the frozen calmness of a dead woman's features. Owing this dreary resemblance to the fact that Hester was actually dead, in respect to any claim of sympathy, and had departed out of the world with which she still seemed to mingle. It might be, on this one day, that there was an expression unseen before, nor, indeed, vivid enough to be detected now, unless some preternaturally gifted observer should have first read the heart, and have afterwards sought a corresponding development in the countenance and mien, such a spiritual seer might have conceived that, after sustaining the gaze of the multitude through seven miserable years as a necessity, a penance and something which it was a stern religion to endure, she now, for one last time more, encountered it freely and voluntarily. In order to convert what had so long been agony into a kind of triumph, Look your last on the scarlet letter and its wearer, the people's victim and lifelong bond slave, as they fancied her. Might say to them, yet a little while, and she will be beyond your reach, a few hours longer, and the deep, mysterious ocean will quench and hide forever the symbol which ye have caused to burn upon her bosom nor were it an inconsistency too improbable to be assigned to human nature. Should we suppose a feeling of regret in Hester's mind, at the moment when she was about to win her freedom from the pain which had been thus deeply incorporated with her being, might there not be an irresistible desire to quaff a last, long, breathless draught of the cup of wormwood and aloes? with which nearly all her years of womanhood had been perpetually flavored, the wine of life henceforth to be presented to her lips, must be indeed rich, delicious, and exhilarating, in its chaste and golden beaker, or else leave an inevitable and weary languor, after the lees of bitterness wherewith she had been drugged, as with a cordial of intensest potency, Pearl was decked out with airy gaiety. It would have been impossible to guess that this bright and sunny apparition owed its existence to the shape of gloomy grey, or that a fancy, at once so gorgeous and so delicate as must have been requisite to contrive the child's apparel, was the same that had achieved a task perhaps more difficult 
in imparting so distinct a peculiarity to Hester's simple robe. The dress, so proper was it to little Pearl, seemed an effluence, or inevitable development, and outward manifestation of her character. No more to be separated from her than the many-hued brilliancy from a butterfly's wing, or the painted glory from the leaf of a bright flower. As with these, so with the child, her garb was all of one idea with her nature. On this eventful day, moreover, there was a certain singular inquietude and excitement in her mood, resembling nothing so much as the shimmer of a diamond. That sparkles and flashes with the varied throbbings of the breast on which it is displayed. Children have always a sympathy in the agitations of those connected with them, always, especially, a sense of any trouble or impending revolution. Of whatever kind, in domestic circumstances, and therefore Pearl, who was the gem on her mother's unquiet bosom. Betrayed by the very dance of her spirits, the emotions which none could detect in the marble passiveness of Hester's brow. This effervescence made her flit with a bird-like movement, rather than walk by her mother's side. She broke continually into shouts of a wild, inarticulate, and sometimes piercing music. When they reached the marketplace, she became still more restless, on perceiving the stir and bustle that enlivened the spot. For it was usually more like the broad and lonesome green before a village meeting house than the center of a town's business. Why, what is this, mother? cried she. Wherefore have all the people left their work today? Is it a play day for the whole world? See, there is the blacksmith. He has washed his sooty face, and put on his Sabbath day clothes, and looks as if he would gladly be merry. If any kind body would only teach him how, and there is Master Brackett, the old jailer, nodding and smiling at me. Why does he do so, mother? He remembers thee a little babe, my child, answered Hester. He should not nod and smile at me, for all that the black, grim, ugly-eyed old man, said Pearl. He may nod at thee if he will, for thou art clad in grey and wearest the scarlet letter. But see, mother, how many faces of strange people, and Indians among them, and sailors, what have they all come to do? Here in the marketplace. They wait to see the procession pass, said Hester. For the governor and the magistrates are to go by, and the ministers, and all the great people and good people. With the music and the soldiers marching before them. And will the minister be there? asked Pearl. And will he hold out both his hands to me? as when thou ledst me to him from the brookside. He will be there, child, answered her mother, but he will not greet thee today, nor must thou greet him. What a strange, sad man is he, said the child, as if speaking partly to herself. In the dark night time he calls us to him, and holds thy hand and mine, as when we stood with him on the scaffold yonder. And in the deep forest, where only the old trees can hear, and the strip of sky see it, he talks with thee. Sitting on a heap of moss, and he kisses my forehead, too, so that the little brook would hardly wash it off, but here, in the sunny day, and among all the people, he knows us not, nor must we know him, 
A strange, sad man is he. With his hand always over his heart. Be quiet, Pearl. Thou understandest not these things, said her mother. Think not now of the minister, but look about thee, and see how cheery is everybody's face today. The children have come from their schools, and the grown people from their workshops and their fields. On purpose to be happy, for today a new man is beginning to rule over them, and so as has been the custom of mankind ever since a nation was first gathered, they make merry and rejoice. As if a good and golden year were at length to pass over the poor old world. It was as Hester said in regard to the unwanted jollity that brightened the faces of the people. Into this festal season of the year as it already was, and continued to be during the greater part of two centuries the Puritans compressed whatever mirth and public joy they deemed allowable to human infirmity, thereby so far dispelling the customary cloud that, for the space of a single holiday, they appeared scarcely more grave than most other communities at a period of general affliction. But we perhaps exaggerate the gray or sable tinge which undoubtedly characterized the mood and manners of the age. The persons now in the marketplace of Boston had not been born to an inheritance of puritanic gloom. They were native Englishmen, whose fathers had lived in the sunny richness of the Elizabethan epoch. A time when the life of England, viewed as one great mass, would appear to have been as stately, magnificent, and joyous as the world has ever witnessed. Had they followed their hereditary taste, the New England settlers would have illustrated all events of public importance by bonfires, banquets, pageantries, and processions. Nor would it have been impracticable in the observance of majestic ceremonies to combine mirthful recreation with solemnity and give as it were, a grotesque and brilliant embroidery to the great robe of state, which a nation, at such festivals, puts on. There was some shadow of an attempt of this kind in the mode of celebrating the day on which the political year of the colony commenced. The dim reflection of a remembered splendor, a colorless and manifold diluted repetition of what they had beheld in proud old London. We will not say at a royal coronation, but at a Lord Mayor's show, might be traced in the customs which our forefathers instituted. With reference to the annual installation of magistrates, the fathers and founders of the Commonwealth, the statesmen, the priest and the soldier deemed it a duty then to assume the outward state and majesty, which, in accordance with antique style, was looked upon as the proper garb of public or social eminence. All came forth to move in procession before the people's eye, and thus impart a needed dignity to the simple framework of a government so newly constructed. Then, too, the people were countenanced, if not encouraged, in relaxing the severe and close application to their various modes of rugged industry, which, at all other times, seemed of the same peace and material with their religion. Here, it is true, were none of the applicances which popular merriment would so readily have found in the England of Elizabeth's time or that of James, no rude shows of a theatrical kind, no minstrel with his harp and legendary ballad, nor gleeman with an ape dancing to his music, no juggler with his tricks of mimic witchcraft, 
no merry Andrew, to stir up the multitude with jests, perhaps hundreds of years old, but still effective. By their appeals to the very broadest sources of mirthful sympathy, all such professors of the several branches of jocularity would have been sternly repressed, not only by the rigid discipline of law, but by the general sentiment which gives law its vitality. Not the less, however, the great, honest face of the people smiled, grimly, perhaps, but widely, too. Nor were sports wanting such as the colonists had witnessed and shared in long ago at the country fairs and on the village greens of England, and which it was thought well to keep alive on this new soil for the sake of the courage and manliness that were essential in them. Wrestling matches, in the different fashions of Cornwall and Devonshire, were seen here and there about the marketplace. In one corner, there was a friendly bout at quarterstaff, and what attracted most interest of all on the platform of the pillory. Already so noted in our pages, two masters of defense were commencing an exhibition with the buckler and broadsword. But, much to the disappointment of the crowd, this latter business was broken off by the interposition of the town beetle who had no idea of permitting the majesty of the law to be violated by such an abuse of one of its consecrated places. It may not be too much to affirm, on the whole, the people being then in the first stages of joyless deportment, and the offspring of sires who had known how to be merry in their day, that they would compare favorably. In point of holiday keeping with their descendants, even at so long an interval as ourselves, their immediate posterity, the generation next to the early emigrants, wore the blackest shade of Puritanism, and so darkened the national visage with it, that all the subsequent years have not sufficed to clear it up. We have yet to learn again the forgotten art of gaiety, the picture of human life in the marketplace, though its general tint was the sad gray, brown, or black of the English emigrants, was yet enlivened by some diversity of hue, a party of Indians in their savage finery of curiously embroidered deerskin robes. Wampum belts, red and yellow ochre and feathers, and armed with the bow and arrow and stone-headed spear stood apart. With countenances of inflexible gravity, beyond what even the Puritan aspect could attain. Nor, wild as were these painted barbarians, were they the wildest feature of the scene. This distinction could more justly be claimed by some mariners, a part of the crew of the vessel from the Spanish main, who had come ashore to see the humors of election day, were rough-looking desperados with some blackened faces and an immensity of beard. Their wide, Short trousers were confined about the waist by belts, often clasped with a rough plate of gold, and sustaining always a long knife, and in some instances, a sword. From beneath their broad-brimmed hats of palm-leaf gleamed eyes which, even in good nature and merriment, had a kind of animal ferocity. They transgressed, without fear or scruple, the rules of behavior that were binding on all others. Smoking tobacco under the beetle's very nose, although each whiff would have cost a townsman a shilling, and quaffing, at their pleasure, draughts of wine or aqua vit from pocket flasks, 
which they freely tendered to the gaping crowd around them. It remarkably characterized the incomplete morality of the age, rigid as we call it, that a license was allowed the seafaring class, not merely for their freaks on shore, but for far more desperate deeds on their proper element. The sailor of that day would go near to be arraigned as a pirate in our own. There could be little doubt, for instance, that this very ship's crew, though no unfavorable specimens of the nautical brotherhood, had been guilty, as we should phrase it, of depredations on the Spanish commerce, such as would have periled all their necks in a modern court of justice. But the sea, in those old times, heaved, swelled, and foamed, very much at its own will, or subject only to the tempestuous wind, with hardly any attempts at regulation by human law. The buccaneer on the wave might relinquish his calling, and become at once, if he chose, a man of probity and piety on land, nor, even in the full career of his reckless life, was he regarded as a personage with whom it was disreputable to traffic or casually associate. Thus, the Puritan elders, in their black cloaks, starched bands, and steeple-crowned hats, smiled not unbenignantly at the clamor and rude deportment of these jolly seafaring men, and it excited neither surprise nor animadversion when so reputable a citizen as old Roger Chillingworth, the physician, was seen to enter the marketplace in close and familiar talk with the commander of the questionable vessel. The latter was by far the most showy and gallant figure, so far as apparel went, anywhere to be seen among the multitude. He wore a profusion of ribbons on his garment, and gold lace on his hat, which was also encircled by a gold chain. And surmounted with a feather, there was a sword at his side, and a sword cut on his forehead, which, by the arrangement of his hair, he seemed anxious rather to display than hide. A landsman could hardly have worn this garb and shown this face, and worn and shown them both with such a galliard air, without undergoing stern question before a magistrate, and probably incurring fine or imprisonment, or perhaps an exhibition in the stocks. As regarded the shipmaster, however, all was looked upon as pertaining to the character, as to a fish his glistening scales. After parting from the physician, the commander of the Bristol ship strolled idly through the marketplace, until, happening to approach the spot where Hester Prynne was standing, he appeared to recognize, and did not hesitate to address her. As was usually the case wherever Hester stood, a small vacant area, a sort of magic circle, had formed itself about her, into which, though the people were elbowing one another at a little distance, none ventured or felt disposed to intrude. It was a forcible type of the moral solitude in which the scarlet letter enveloped its fated wearer, partly by her own reserve, and partly by the instinctive, though no longer so unkindly, withdrawal of her fellow creatures. Now, if never before, it answered a good purpose, by enabling Hester and the seamen to speak together without risk of being overheard. And so changed was Hester Prynne's repute before the public, that the matron in town most eminent, for rigid morality could not have held such intercourse with less result of scandal than herself. 
So, mistress, said the mariner, I must bid the steward make ready one more berth than you bargained for, no fear of scurvy or ship fever. This voyage, what with the ship's surgeon and this other doctor, our only danger will be from drug or pill. More by token, as there is a lot of apothecary's stuff aboard, which I traded for with a Spanish vessel. What mean you? inquired Hester, startled more than she permitted to appear. Have you another passenger? Why, know you not, cried the shipmaster, that this physician here Chillingworth, he calls himself as minded to try my cabin fare with you, I, I, you must have known it. For he tells me he is of your party, and a close friend to the gentleman you spoke of, he that is in peril from these sour old Puritan rulers. They know each other well, indeed, replied Hester, with a mien of calmness, though in the utmost consternation. They have long dwelt together. Nothing further passed between the mariner and Hester Prynne. But, at that instant, she beheld old Roger Chillingworth himself, standing in the remotest corner of the market-place, and smiling on her, a smile which across the wide and bustling square, and through all the talk and laughter, and various thoughts, moods, and interests of the crowd conveyed secret and fearful meaning. Roman 22. The procession. Before Hester Prynne could call together her thoughts, and consider what was practicable to be done in this new and startling aspect of affairs. The sound of military music was heard approaching along a contiguous street. It denoted the advance of the procession of magistrates and citizens on its way towards the meeting-house, where, in compliance with a custom thus early established, and ever since observed, the Reverend Mr. de Misdale was to deliver an election sermon. Soon the head of the procession showed itself, with a slow and stately march, turning a corner, and making its way across the marketplace. First came the music. It comprised a variety of instruments, perhaps imperfectly adapted to one another, and played with no great skill, but yet attaining the great object for which the harmony of drum and clarion addresses itself to the multitude that of imparting a higher and more heroic air to the scene of life that passes before the eye. Little Pearl at first clapped her hands, but then lost, for an instant, the restless agitation that had kept her in a continual effervescence throughout the morning. She gazed silently, and seemed to be borne upward, like a floating sea bird, on the long heaves and swells of sound. But she was brought back to her former mood by the shimmer of the sunshine on the weapons and bright armor of the military company, which followed after the music and formed the honorary escort of the procession. This body of soldiery, which still sustains a corporate existence and marches down from past ages, with an ancient and honorable fame was composed of no mercenary materials. Its ranks were filled with gentlemen, who felt the stirrings of martial impulse, and sought to establish a kind of college of arms, where, as in an association of Knights Templars, they might learn the science, and, so far as peaceful exercise would teach them, the practices of war, the high estimation then placed upon the military character might be seen in the lofty port of each individual member of the company. Some of them, indeed, 
by their services in the Low Countries and on other fields of European warfare, had fairly won their title to assume the name and pomp of soldiership. The entire array, moreover, clad in burnished steel, and with plumage nodding over their bright morions, had a brilliancy of effect which no modern display can aspire to equal. And yet the men of civil eminence, who came immediately behind the military escort, were better worth a thoughtful observer's eye. Even in outward demeanor, they showed a stamp of majesty that made the warrior's haughty stride look vulgar. If not absurd, it was an age when what we call talent had far less consideration than now, but the massive materials which produced stability and dignity of character a great deal more. The people possessed, by hereditary right, the quality of reverence which in their descendants, if it survive at all, exists in smaller proportion and with a vastly diminished force in the selection and estimate of public men. The change may be for good or ill, and is partly, perhaps, for both. In that old day, the English settler on these rude shores having left king, nobles, and all degrees of awful rank behind, while still the faculty and necessity of reverence were strong in him bestowed it on the white hair and venerable brow of age. On long-tried integrity, on solid wisdom, and sad-colored experience, on endowments of that grave and weighty order which gives the idea of permanence, and comes under the general definition of respectability, these primitive statesmen, therefore, Bradstreet, Endicott, Dudley, Bellingham, and their compeers, who were elevated to power by the early choice of the people, seem to have been not often brilliant, but distinguished by a ponderous sobriety, rather than activity of intellect. They had fortitude and self-reliance and, in time of difficulty or peril, stood up for the welfare of the state like a line of cliffs against a tempestuous tide. The traits of character here indicated were well represented in the square cast of countenance and large physical development of the new colonial magistrates. So far as a demeanor of natural authority was concerned, the mother country need not have been ashamed to see these foremost men of an actual democracy adopted into the House of Peers, or made the privy council of the sovereign. Next, in order to the magistrates, came the young and eminently distinguished divine, from whose lips the religious discourse of the anniversary was expected. His was the profession, at that era, in which intellectual ability displayed itself far more than in political life. For leaving a higher motive out of the question it offered inducements powerful enough, in the almost worshipping respect of the community, to win the most aspiring ambition into its service, even political power, as in the case of increased matter, was within the grasp of a successful priest. It was the observation of those who beheld him now, that never, since Mr. de Misdale first set his foot on the New England shore, had he exhibited such energy, as was seen in the gait and air with which he kept his pace in the procession. There was no feebleness of step, as at other times. His frame was not bent, nor did his hand rest ominously upon his heart. Yet, if the clergyman were rightly viewed, his strength seemed not of the body. It might be spiritual, and imparted to him by angelic ministrations. 
it might be the exhilaration of that potent cordial which is distilled only in the furnace glow of earnest and long-continued thought or perchance his sensitive temperament was invigorated by the loud and piercing music that swelled heavenward and uplifted him on its ascending wave nevertheless so abstracted was his look it might be questioned whether mr de misdale even heard the music there was his body moving onward and with an unaccustomed force but where was his mind far and deep in its own region busying itself with preternatural activity to marshal a procession of stately thoughts that were soon to issue thence. And so he saw nothing, heard nothing, knew nothing, of what was around him, but the spiritual element took up the feeble frame and carried it along, unconscious of the burden, and converting it to spirit like itself. Men of uncommon intellect, who have grown morbid, possess this occasional power of mighty effort, into which they throw the life of many days, and then are lifeless for as many more. Hester Prynne, gazing steadfastly at the clergyman, felt a dreary influence come over her. But wherefore or whence she knew not, unless that he seemed so remote from her own sphere, and utterly beyond her reach. One glance of recognition, she had imagined, must needs pass between them. She thought of the dim forest, with its little dell of solitude, and love, and anguish, and the mossy tree trunk, where, sitting hand in hand, they had mingled their sad and passionate talk with the melancholy murmur of the brook. How deeply had they known each other then, and was this the man? She hardly knew him now, he, moving proudly past. Enveloped, as it were, in the rich music, with the procession of majestic and venerable fathers, he so unattainable in his worldly position, and still more so in that far vista of his unsympathizing thoughts, through which she now beheld him, her spirit sank with the idea that all must have been a delusion, and that, vividly as she had dreamed it, there could be no real bond betwixt the clergyman and herself. And thus much of woman was there in Hester, that she could scarcely forgive him, least of all now, when the heavy footstep of their approaching fate might be heard. Nearer, 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 for being able so completely to withdraw himself from their mutual world. While she groped darkly, and stretched forth her cold hands, and found him not, Pearl either saw and responded to her mother's feelings, or herself felt the remoteness and intangibility that had fallen around the minister. While the procession passed, the child was uneasy, fluttering up and down, like a bird on the point of taking flight. When the whole had gone by, she looked up into Hester's face. Mother, said she, was that the same minister that kissed me by the brook. Hold thy peace, dear little Pearl, whispered her mother. We must not always talk in the marketplace of what happens to us in the forest. I could not be sure that it was he, so strange he looked, continued the child else I would have run to him, and bid him kiss me now before all the people, even as he did yonder among the dark old trees. What would the minister have said, Mother, would he have clapped his hand over his heart, and scowled on me? 
and bid me be gone. What should he say, Pearl? Answered Hester, save that it was no time to kiss, and that kisses are not to be given in the marketplace. Well for thee. Foolish child, that thou didst not speak to him. Another shade of the same sentiment in reference to Mr. de Misdale was expressed by a person whose eccentricities or insanity, as we should term it, led her to do what few of the town's people would have ventured on, to begin a conversation with the wearer of the scarlet letter in public. It was Mistress Hibbins, who, arrayed in great magnificence, with a triple ruff, a broidered stomacher, a gown of rich velvet, and a gold-headed cane, had come forth to see the procession. As this ancient lady had the renown which subsequently cost her no less a price than her life of being a principal actor in all the works of necromancy that were continually going forward, the crowd gave way before her, and seemed to fear the touch of her garment, as if it carried the plague among its gorgeous folds. Seen in conjunction with Hester Prynne, kindly as so many now felt towards the latter, the dread inspired by Mistress Hibbins was doubled, and caused a general movement from that part of the marketplace in which the two women stood. Now, what mortal imagination could conceive it, whispered the old lady, confidentially, to Hester. Yonder divine man, that saint on earth, as the people uphold him to be, and as I must needs say he really looks, who? Now, that saw him pass in the procession, would think how little while it is since he went forth out of his study. Chewing a Hebrew text of scripture in his mouth, I warrant, to take an airing in the forest, aha, we know what that means. Hester Prynne, but, truly, forsooth, I find it hard to believe him the same man. Many a church member saw I walking behind the music that has danced in the same measure with me when somebody was fiddler. And it might be an Indian powwow or a Lapland wizard changing hands with us. That is but a trifle when a woman knows the world. But this minister, couldst thou surely tell, Hester, whether he was the same man that encountered thee on the forest path? Madam, I know not of what you speak, answered Hester Prynne feeling Mistress Hibbins to be of infirm mind. Yet, strangely startled and awe-stricken by the confidence with which she affirmed a personal connection between so many persons herself among them and the evil one, it is not for me to talk lightly of a learned and pious minister of the word, like the Reverend Mr. de Misdale. Fie, woman! Fie, cried the old lady, shaking her finger at Hester. Dost thou think I have been to the forest so many times, and have yet no skill to judge who else has been there, yea? Though no leaf of the wild garlands, which they wore while they danced, be left in their hair, I know thee. Hester, for I behold the token. We may all see it in the sunshine, and it glows like a red flame in the dark. Thou wearest it openly, so there need be no question about that. But this minister, let me tell thee in thine ear, when the black man sees one of his own servants, signed and sealed, so shy of owning to the bond as is the Reverend Mr. de Misdale, he hath a way of ordering matters, so that the mark shall be disclosed in open daylight to the eyes of all the world. What is it that the minister seeks to hide? 
with his hand always over his heart. Ha, ah, Hester Prynne. What is it, good Mistress Hibbins? eagerly asked little Pearl. Haste thou seen it. No matter, darling, responded Mistress Hibbins, making Pearl a profound reverence. Thou thyself wilt see it, one time or another. They say, child, thou art of the lineage of the prince of the air. Wilt thou ride with me? Some fine night, to see thy father. Then thou shalt know wherefore the minister keeps his hand over his heart. Laughing so shrilly that all the marketplace could hear her, the weird old gentlewoman took her departure. By this time, the preliminary prayer had been offered in the meeting-house, and the accents of the Reverend Mr. Dimmesdale were heard commencing his discourse. An irresistible feeling kept Hester near the spot. As the sacred edifice was too much thronged to admit another auditor, she took up her position close beside the scaffold of the pillory, it was in sufficient proximity to bring the whole sermon to her ears in the shape of an indistinct but varied murmur and flow of the minister's very peculiar voice. This vocal organ was in itself a rich endowment, insomuch that a listener, comprehending nothing of the language in which the preacher spoke, might still have been swayed to and fro by the mere tone and cadence. Like all other music, it breathed passion and pathos and emotions high or tender, in a tongue native to the human heart. Wherever educated, muffled, as the sound was by its passage through the church walls, Hester Prynne listened with such intentness and sympathized so intimately that the sermon had throughout a meaning for her entirely apart from its indistinguishable words. These, perhaps, if more distinctly heard, might have been only a grosser medium and have clogged the spiritual sense. Now she caught the low undertone, as of the wind sinking down to repose itself, then ascended with it as it rose through progressive gradations of sweetness and power, until its volume seemed to envelop her with an atmosphere of awe and solemn grandeur. And yet, majestic as the voice sometimes became, there was forever in it an essential character of plaintiveness, a loud or low expression of anguish, the whisper or the shriek, as it might be conceived, of suffering humanity. That touched a sensibility in every bosom. At times this deep strain of pathos was all that could be heard. And scarcely heard, sighing amid a desolate silence. But even when the minister's voice grew high and commanding, when it gushed irrepressibly upward, when it assumed its utmost breadth and power, so overfilling the church as to burst its way through the solid walls and diffuse itself in the open air. Still, if the auditor listened intently, and for the purpose, he could detect the same cry of pain. What was it? The complaint of a human heart, sorrow-laden, perchance guilty, telling its secret, whether of guilt or sorrow, to the great heart of mankind, beseeching its sympathy or forgiveness at every moment in each accent. And never in vain, it was this profound and continual undertone that gave the clergyman his most appropriate power. During all this time, Hester stood statue-like at the foot of the scaffold. If the minister's voice had not kept her there, 
there would nevertheless have been an inevitable magnetism in that spot. Whence she dated the first hour of her life of ignominy. There was a sense within her, too ill defined to be made of thought, but weighing heavily on her mind, that her whole orb of life, both before and after, was connected with this spot, as with the one point that gave it unity. Little Pearl, meanwhile, had quitted her mother's side, and was playing at her own will about the marketplace. She made the somber crowd cheerful by her erratic and glistening ray, even as a bird of bright plumage illuminates a whole tree of dusky foliage, by darting to and fro, half seen and half concealed amid the twilight of the clustering leaves. She had an undulating, but oftentimes, a sharp and irregular movement. It indicated the restless vivacity of her spirit, which today was doubly indefatigable in its tiptoe dance. Because it was played upon and vibrated with her mother's disquietude. Whenever Pearl saw anything to excite her ever active and wandering curiosity, as we might say, seized upon that man or thing as her own property, so far as she desired it. But without yielding the minutest degree of control over her motions and requital, the Puritans looked on, and, if they smiled, were none the less inclined to pronounce the child a demon offspring. From the indescribable charm of beauty and eccentricity that shone through her little figure and sparkled with its activity, she ran and looked the wild Indian in the face, and he grew conscious of a nature wilder than his own. Thence, with native audacity, but still with a reserve as characteristic, she flew into the midst of a group of mariners. The swarthy cheeked wild men of the ocean, as the Indians were of the land, and they gazed wonderingly and admiringly at Pearl, as if a flake of the sea foam had taken the shape of a little maid, and were gifted with a soul of the sea fire that flashes beneath the prow in the night time. One of these seafaring men, the shipmaster, indeed, who had spoken to Hester Prynne was so smitten with Pearl's aspect that he attempted to lay hands upon her with purpose to snatch a kiss. Finding it as impossible to touch her as to catch a humming bird in the air, he took from his hat the gold chain that was twisted about it and threw it to the child. Pearl immediately twined it around her neck and waist with such happy skill that, once seen there, it became a part of her, and it was difficult to imagine her without it. My mother is yonder woman with the scarlet letter, said the seaman. Wilt thou carry her a message from me? Then tell her, rejoined he, that I spake again with the black avisaged, humped shouldered old doctor, and he engages to bring his friend, the gentleman she wots of, aboard with him. So let thy mother take no thought save for herself and thee. Wilt thou tell her this, thou witch baby? Mistress Hibbins says my father is the prince of the air, cried Pearl. With a naughty smile, if thou callest me that ill name, I shall tell him of thee, and he will chase thy ship with a tempest. Pursuing a zigzag course across the marketplace, the child returned to her mother, and communicated what the mariner had said. Hester's strong, calm, steadfastly enduring spirit almost sank at last, 
on beholding this dark and grim countenance of an inevitable doom, which at the moment when a passage seemed to open for the minister and herself, out of their labyrinth of misery showed itself. With an unrelenting smile, right in the midst of their path. With her mind harassed by the terrible perplexity in which the shipmaster's intelligence involved her, she was also subjected to another trial. There were many people present, from the country round about, who had often heard of the scarlet letter, and to whom it had been made terrific by a hundred false or exaggerated rumors, but who had never beheld it with their own bodily eyes. These, after exhausting other modes of amusement, now thronged about Hester Prynne with rude and boorish intrusiveness. Unscrupulous as it was, however, it could not bring them nearer than a circuit of several yards. At that distance they accordingly stood, fixed there by the centrifugal force of the repugnance which the mystic symbol inspired. The whole gang of sailors, likewise, observing the press of spectators, and learning the purport of the scarlet letter, came and thrust their sunburnt and desperado-looking faces into the ring. Even the Indians were affected by a sort of cold shadow of the white man's curiosity, and, gliding through the crowd, fastened their snake-like black eyes on Hester's bosom, conceiving, perhaps, that the wearer of this brilliantly embroidered badge must needs be a personage of high dignity among her people. Lastly, the inhabitants of the town, their own interest in this worn-out subject languidly reviving itself. By sympathy with what they saw others feel lounged idly to the same quarter, and tormented Hester Prynne. Perhaps more than all the rest, with their cool, well-acquainted gaze at her familiar shame, Hester saw and recognized the self-same faces of that group of matrons who had awaited her forthcoming from the prison door. Seven years ago, all save one, the youngest and only compassionate among them, whose burial robe she had since made. At the final hour, when she was so soon to fling aside the burning letter, it had strangely become the center of more remark and excitement, and was thus made to sear her breast more painfully than at any time since the first day she put it on. While Hester stood in that magic circle of ignominy, where the cunning cruelty of her sentence seemed to have fixed her forever. The admirable preacher was looking down from the sacred pulpit upon an audience whose very inmost spirits had yielded to his control. The sainted minister in the church, the woman of the scarlet letter in the marketplace, what imagination would have been irreverent enough to surmise that the same scorching stigma was on them both. Roman 23. The Revelation of the Scarlet Letter. The eloquent voice, on which the souls of the listening audience had been borne aloft as on the swelling waves of the sea, at length came to a pause. There was a momentary silence, profound as what should follow the utterance of oracles. Then ensued a murmur and half-hushed tumult, as if the auditors, released from the high spell that had transported them into the region of another's mind, were returning into themselves, with all their awe and wonder still heavy on them. In a moment more, the crowd began to gush forth from the doors of the church. Now that there was an end, they needed other breath, more fit to support the gross and earthly life into which they relapsed. Then, 
that atmosphere which the preacher had converted into words of flame, and had burdened with the rich fragrance of his thought. In the open air their rapture broke into speech. The street and the marketplace absolutely babbled, from side to side. The applauses of the minister. According to their united testimony, never had man spoken in so wise, so high, and so holy a spirit, as he that spake this day, or had inspiration ever breathed through mortal lips more evidently than it did through his, its influence could be seen, as it were, descending upon him, and possessing him, and continually lifting him out of the written discourse that lay before him, and filling him with ideas that must have been as marvelous to himself as to his audience. His subject, it appeared, had been the relation between the deity and the communities of mankind, with a special reference to the New England which they were here planting in the wilderness. And, as he drew towards the close, a spirit as of prophecy had come upon him, constraining him to its purpose as mightily as the old prophets of Israel were constrained. Only with this difference that, whereas the Jewish seers had denounced judgments and ruin on their country, it was his mission to foretell a high and glorious destiny for the newly gathered people of the Lord. But throughout it all, and through the whole discourse, there had been a certain deep, sad undertone of pathos, which could not be interpreted otherwise than as the natural regret of one soon to pass away. Yes, their minister whom they so loved, and who so loved them all, that he could not depart heavenward without a sigh had the foreboding of untimely death upon him, and would soon leave them in their tears, this idea of his transitory stay on earth gave the last emphasis to the effect which the preacher had produced. It was as if an angel, in his passage to the skies, had shaken his bright wings over the people for an instant. At once a shadow and a splendor, and had shed down a shower of golden truths upon them. Thus, there had come to the Reverend Mr. Demisdale, as to most men, in their various spheres, though seldom recognized, until they see it far behind them, an epoch of life more brilliant and full of triumph than any previous one. Or than any which could hereafter be, he stood at this moment, on the very proudest eminence of superiority, to which the gifts of intellect, rich lore, prevailing eloquence, and a reputation of whitest sanctity, could exalt a clergyman in New England's earliest days, when the professional character was of itself a lofty pedestal. Such was the position which the minister occupied, as he bowed his head forward on the cushions of the pulpit. At the close of his election sermon, meanwhile Hester Prynne was standing beside the scaffold of the pillory, with the scarlet letter still burning on her breast. Now was heard again the clangor of the music, and the measured tramp of the military escort, issuing from the church door. The procession was to be marshaled thence to the town hall, where a solemn banquet would complete the ceremonies of the day. Once more, therefore, the train of venerable, and majestic fathers was seen moving through a broad pathway of the people, who drew back reverently on either side, as the governor and magistrates, the old and wise men, the holy ministers, and all that were eminent and renowned, advanced into the midst of them. 
when they were fairly in the marketplace, their presence was greeted by a shout. This, though doubtless it might acquire additional force and volume from the childlike loyalty which the age awarded to its rulers, was felt to be an irrepressible outburst of enthusiasm kindled in the auditors by that high strain of eloquence which was yet reverberating in their ears. Each felt the impulse in himself, and, in the same breath, caught it from his neighbor. Within the church, it had hardly been kept down beneath the sky. It peeled upward to the zenith. There were human beings enough, and enough of highly wrought and symphonious feeling, to produce that more impressive sound than the organ tones of the blast, or the thunder, or the roar of the sea, even that mighty swell of many voices, blended into one great voice, by the universal impulse which makes likewise one vast heart out of the many. Never, from the soil of New England, had gone up such a shout, never, on New England soil, had stood the man so honored by his mortal brethren as the preacher. How fared it with him, then? Were there not the brilliant particles of a halo in the air about his head? so etherealized by spirit as he was, and so apotheosized by worshipping admirers, did his footsteps, in the procession, really tread upon the dust of earth. As the ranks of military men and civil fathers moved onward, all eyes were turned towards the point where the minister was seen to approach among them, a shout died into a murmur, as one portion of the crowd after another obtained a glimpse of him. How feeble and pale he looked, amid all his triumph, the energy or say, rather, the inspiration which had held him up. Until he should have delivered the sacred message that brought its own strength along with it from heaven was withdrawn. Now that it had so faithfully performed its office, the glow which they had just before beheld burning on his cheek was extinguished like a flame that sinks down hopelessly among the late decaying embers. It seemed hardly the face of a man alive, with such a death-like hue. It was hardly a man with life in him that tottered on his path so nervelessly, yet tottered, and did not fall. One of his clerical brethren, it was the venerable John Wilson, observing the state in which Mr. Demisdale was left by the retiring wave of intellect and sensibility, stepped forward hastily to offer his support. The minister tremulously but decidedly, repelled the old man's arm. He still walked onward, if that movement could be so described, which rather resembled the wavering effort of an infant. With its mother's arms in view, outstretched to tempt him forward. And now, almost imperceptible as were the latter steps of his progress, he had come opposite the well-remembered and weather-darkened scaffold, where, long since, with all that dreary lapse of time between, Hester Prynne had encountered the world's ignominious stare. There stood Hester, holding little Pearl by the hand, and there was the scarlet letter on her breast. The minister here made a pause. Although the music still played the stately and rejoicing march to which the procession moved, it summoned him onward, onward to the festival, but here he made a pause. Bellingham, for the last few moments, had kept an anxious eye upon him. He now left his own place in the procession, and advanced to give assistance, judging from Mr. Dimmesdale's aspect. 
that he must otherwise inevitably fall but there was something in the latter's expression that warned back the magistrate although a man not readily obeying the vague intimations that pass from one spirit to another the crowd meanwhile looked on with awe and wonder this earthly faintness was in their view only another phase of the minister's celestial strength nor would it have seemed a miracle too high to be wrought for one so holy had he ascended before their eyes waxing dimmer and brighter and fading at last into the light of heaven he turned towards the scaffold and stretched forth his arms hester said he come hither come my little pearl it was a ghastly look with which he regarded them but there was something at once tender and strangely triumphant in it the child with the bird-like motion which was one of her characteristics flew to him and clasped her arms about his knees hester prince slowly as if impelled by inevitable fate and against her strongest will likewise drew near but paused before she reached him at this instant old roger chillingworth thrust himself through the crowd or perhaps so dark disturbed and evil was his look he rose up out of some nether region to snatch back his victim from what he sought to do be that as it might the old man rushed forward and caught the minister by the arm. Madman, hold, what is your purpose? whispered he, wave back that woman, cast off this child, all shall be well, do not blacken your fame. And perish in dishonor, I can yet save you, would you bring infamy on your sacred profession? Ha, ah, tempter, methinks thou art too late, answered the minister, encountering his eye fearfully, but firmly. Thy power is not what it was with God's help, I shall escape thee now. He again extended his hand to the woman of the scarlet letter. Hester Prynne, cried he, with a piercing earnestness, in the name of him, so terrible and so merciful who gives me grace at this last moment to do what for my own heavy sin and miserable agony i withheld myself from doing seven years ago come hither now and twine thy strength about me thy strength hester but let it be guided by the will which god hath granted me this wretched and wronged old man is opposing it with all his might, with all his own might. And the fiends, come, Hester, come, support me up yonder scaffold. The crowd was in a tumult. The men of rank and dignity, who stood more immediately around the clergyman, were so taken by surprise and so perplexed as to the purport of what they saw unable to receive the explanation which most readily presented itself or to imagine any other that they remained silent and inactive spectators of the judgment which providence seemed about to work they beheld the minister leaning on hester's shoulder and supported by her arm around him approach the scaffold and ascend its steps while still the little hand of the sin-born child was clasped in his old roger chillingworth followed as one intimately connected with the drama of guilt and sorrow in which they had all been actors and well entitled therefore to be present at its closing scene Hadst thou sought the whole earth over, said he, looking darkly at the clergyman, there was no one placed so secret. 
no high place nor lowly place, where thou couldst have escaped me, save on this very scaffold. Thanks be to him who hath led me hither, answered the minister. Yet he trembled, and turned to Hester with an expression of doubt and anxiety in his eyes, not the less evidently betrayed. That there was a feeble smile upon his lips. Is not this better, murmured he, than what we dreamed of in the forest? I know not, I know not, she hurriedly replied, better, yea, so we may both die, and little Pearl die with us. For thee and Pearl, be it as God shall order, said the minister, and God is merciful, let me now do the will which he hath made plain before my sight. For, Hester, I am a dying man, so let me make haste to take my shame upon me. Partly supported by Hester Prynne, and holding one hand of little pearls, the Reverend Mr. de Misdale turned to the dignified and venerable rulers, to the holy ministers, who were his brethren, to the people, whose great heart was thoroughly appalled. Yet overflowing with tearful sympathy, as knowing that some deep life matter which, if full of sin, was full of anguish and repentance likewise, was now to be laid open to them. The sun, but little past its meridian, shone down upon the clergyman, and gave a distinctness to his figure. As he stood out from all the earth, to put in his plea of guilty at the bar of eternal justice, People of New England, cried he, with a voice that rose over them, high, solemn, and majestic, yet had always a tremor through it, and sometimes a shriek, struggling up out of a fathomless depth of remorse and woe, ye, that have loved me, ye, that have deemed me holy, behold me here, the one sinner of the world, at last, at last, I stand upon the spot where, seven years since, I should have stood here with this woman, whose arm more than the little strength wherewith I have crept hitherward, sustains me at this dreadful moment, from groveling down upon my face, lo, the scarlet letter which Hester wears, ye have all shuddered at it, wherever her walk hath been. Wherever, so miserably burdened, she may have hoped to find repose, it hath cast a lurid gleam of awe and horrible repugnance round about her. But there stood one in the midst of you, at whose brand of sin and infamy ye have not shuddered. It seemed at this point, as if the minister must leave the remainder of his secret undisclosed, but he fought back the bodily weakness, and, still more, the faintness of heart, that was striving for the mastery with him. He threw off all assistance, and stepped passionately forward a pace before the woman and the child. It was on him, he continued, with a kind of fierceness, so determined was he to speak out the whole, God's I beheld it, the angels were forever pointing at it, the devil knew it well, and fretted it continually with the touch of his burning finger, but he hid it cunningly from men, and walked among you with the mien of a spirit mournful, because so pure in a sinful world, and sad, because he missed his heavenly kindred. Now, at the death hour, he stands up before you, he bids you look again at Hester's scarlet letter, he tells you that, with all its mysterious horror, it is but the shadow of what he bears on his own breast, and that even this, his own red stigma, 
is no more than the type of what has seared his inmost heart, stand any here that question God's judgment on a sinner, behold, behold a dreadful witness of it. With a convulsive motion, he tore away the ministerial band from before his breast. It was revealed, but it were irreverent to describe that revelation. For an instant, the gaze of the horror-stricken multitude was consented on the ghastly miracle. While the minister stood, with a flush of triumph in his face, as one who, in the crisis of acutest pain, had won a victory. Then, down he sank upon the scaffold, Hester partly raised him, and supported his head against her bosom. Old Roger Chillingworth knelt down beside him, with a blank, dull countenance, out of which the life seemed to have departed. Thou haste escaped me, he repeated more than once. Thou haste escaped me. May God forgive thee, said the minister. Thou, too, haste deeply sinned. He withdrew his dying eyes from the old man and fixed them on the woman and the child. My little pearl, said he feebly, and there was a sweet and gentle smile over his face, as of a spirit sinking into deep repose. Nay, now that the burden was removed, it seemed almost as if he would be sportive with the child, dear little pearl. Wilt thou kiss me now? Thou wouldst not yonder in the forest, but now thou wilt. Pearl kissed his lips. A spell was broken, a great scene of grief, in which the wild infant bore a part. Had developed all her sympathies, and as her tears fell upon her father's cheek, they were the pledge that she would grow up amid human joy and sorrow nor forever do battle with the world, but be a woman in it. Towards her mother, too, Pearl's errand as a messenger of anguish was all fulfilled. Hester, said the clergyman, farewell. Shall we not meet again, whispered she, bending her face down close to his. Shall we not spend our immortal life together? Surely, surely, we have ransomed one another. With all this woe, thou lookest far into eternity. With those bright dying eyes, then tell me what thou seest. Hush, Hester, hush, said he, with tremulous solemnity. The law we broke the sin here so awfully revealed, let these alone be in thy thoughts, I fear, I fear it may be, that when we forgot our God, when we violated our reverence each for the other's soul, it was thenceforth vain to hope that we could meet hereafter. In an everlasting and pure reunion, God knows, and he is merciful, he hath proved his mercy, most of all, in my afflictions, by giving me this burning torture to bear upon my breast, by sending yonder dark and terrible old man, to keep the torture always at red heat, by bringing me hither, to die this death of triumphant ignominy before the people, had either of these agonies been wanting. I had been lost forever, praised be his name, his will be done, farewell. That final word came forth with the minister's expiring breath. The multitude, silent till then, broke out in a strange, deep voice of awe and wonder, which could not as yet find utterance. Save in this murmur that rolled so heavily after the departed spirit. Roman 24 Conclusion After many days, 
when time sufficed for the people to arrange their thoughts in reference to the foregoing scene. There was more than one account of what had been witnessed on the scaffold. Most of the spectators testified to having seen, on the breast of the unhappy minister, a scarlet letter the very semblance of that worn by Hester Prynne imprinted in the flesh. As regarded its origin, there were various explanations, all of which must necessarily have been conjectural. Some affirmed that the Reverend Mr. Dimmesdale, on the very day when Hester Prynne first wore her ignominious badge, had begun a course of penance, which he afterwards, in so many futile methods, followed out by inflicting a hideous torture on himself. Others contended that the stigma had not been produced until a long time subsequent, when old Roger Chillingworth, being a potent necromancer, had caused it to appear through the agency of magic and poisonous drugs. Others, again, and those best able to appreciate the minister's peculiar sensibility and the wonderful operation of his spirit upon the body, whispered their belief that the awful symbol was the effect of the ever-active tooth of remorse, gnawing from the inmost heart outwardly, and at last manifesting heaven's dreadful judgment by the visible presence of the letter. The reader may choose among these theories. We have thrown all the light we could acquire upon the portent, and would gladly, now that it has done its office, erase its deep print out of our own brain. Where long meditation has fixed it in very undesirable distinctness. It is singular, nevertheless, that certain persons, who were spectators of the whole scene and professed never once to have removed their eyes from the Reverend Mr. de Misdale, denied that there was any mark whatever on his breast, more than on a newborn infant's. Neither, by their report, had his dying words acknowledged, nor even remotely implied, any, the slightest connection on his part, with the guilt for which Hester Prynne had so long worn the scarlet letter. According to these highly respectable witnesses, the minister, conscious that he was dying, conscious. Also, that the reverence of the multitude placed him already among saints and angels, had desired, by yielding up his breath in the arms of that fallen woman, to express to the world how utterly nugatory is the choicest of man's own righteousness. After exhausting life in his efforts for mankind's spiritual good, he had made the manner of his death a parable. In order to impress on his admirers the mighty and mournful lesson that, in the view of infinite purity, we are sinners all alike. It was to teach them that the holiest among us has but attained so far above his fellows as to discern more clearly the mercy which looks down and repudiate more utterly the phantom of human merit which would look aspiringly upward without disputing a truth so momentous we must be allowed to consider this version of Mr. de Misdale's story as only an instance of that stubborn fidelity with which a man's friends, and especially a clergyman's, will sometimes uphold his character. When proofs, clear as the midday sunshine on the scarlet letter, establish him a false and sin-stained creature of the dust, the authority which we have chiefly followed, some of whom had known Hester Prynne, while others had heard the tale from contemporary witnesses, fully confirms the view taken in the foregoing pages. 
among many morals which press upon us from the poor minister's miserable experience we put only this into a sentence be true be true be true show freely to the world if not your worst yet some trait whereby the worst may be inferred nothing was more remarkable than the change which took place almost immediately after mr de misdale's death in the appearance and demeanour of the old man known as roger chillingworth all his strength and energy all his vital and intellectual force seemed at once to desert him insomuch that he positively withered up shriveled away and almost vanished from mortal sight like an uprooted weed that lies wilting in the sun this unhappy man had made the very principle of his life to consist in the pursuit and systematic exercise of revenge and when by its completest triumph and consummation that evil principle was left with no further material to support it when in short there was no more devil's work on earth for him to do it only remained for the unhumanized mortal to betake himself whither his master would find him tasks enough and pay him his wages duly but to all these shadowy beings so long our near acquaintances as well roger chillingworth as his companions we would fain be merciful it is a curious subject of observation and inquiry whether hatred and love be not the same thing at bottom each in its utmost development supposes a high degree of intimacy and heart knowledge each renders one individual dependent for the food of his affections and spiritual life upon another each leaves the passionate lover or the no less passionate hater forlorn and desolate by the withdrawal of his subject philosophically considered therefore the two passions seem essentially the same except that one happens to be seen in a celestial radiance and the other in a dusky and lurid glow in the spiritual world the old physician and the minister mutual victims as they have been may unawares have found their earthly stock of hatred and antipathy transmuted into golden love leaving this discussion apart we have a matter of business to communicate to the reader at old roger chillingworth's decease which took place within the year and by his last will and testament of which governor bellingham and the reverend mr wilson were executors he bequeathed a very considerable amount of property both here and in england to little pearl the daughter of hester prynne so pearl the elf child the demon offspring as some people up to that epoch persisted in considering her became the richest heiress of her day in the new world not improbably this circumstance wrought a very material change in the public estimation and had the mother and child remained here little pearl at a marriageable period of life might have mingled her wild blood with the lineage of the devoutest puritan among them all but in no long time after the physician's death the wearer of the scarlet letter disappeared and pearl along with her for many years though a vague report would now and then find its way across the sea like a shapeless piece of drift would tossed ashore with the initials of a name upon it yet no tidings of them unquestionably authentic were received the story of the scarlet letter grew into a legend its spell however was still potent 
and kept the scaffold awful where the poor minister had died. And likewise the cottage by the seashore, where Hester Prynne had dwelt. Near this latter spot, one afternoon, some children were at play, when they beheld a tall woman, in a grey robe, approach the cottage door. In all those years it had never once been opened, but either she unlocked it, or the decaying wood and iron yielded to her hand, or she glided shadow-like through these impediments, and, at all events, went in. On the threshold she paused, turned partly round, for, perchance, the idea of entering all alone. And all so changed, the home of so intense a former life was more dreary and desolate than even she could bear. But her hesitation was only for an instant, though long enough to display a scarlet letter on her breast. And Hester Prynne had returned, and taken up her long forsaken shame, but where was little Pearl if still alive? She must now have been in the flush and bloom of early womanhood. None knew nor ever learned, with the fullness of perfect certainty, whether the elf child had gone thus untimely to a maiden grave or whether her wild, rich nature had been softened and subdued, and made capable of a woman's gentle happiness. But, through the remainder of Hester's life, there were indications that the recluse of the scarlet letter was the object of love and interest with some inhabitant of another land. Letters came with armorial seals upon them, though of bearings unknown to English heraldry. In the cottage there were articles of comfort and luxury such as Hester never cared to use, but which only wealth could have purchased. And affection have imagined for her. There were trifles, two little ornaments, beautiful tokens of a continual remembrance. That must have been wrought by delicate fingers, at the impulse of a fond heart. And once Hester was seen embroidering a baby garment, with such a lavish richness of golden fancy, as would have raised a public tumult. Had any infant, thus apparelled, been shown to our sober-hued community? In fine... The gossips of that day believed, and Mr. Surveyor Pugh, who made investigations a century later, believed, and one of his recent successors in office, moreover, faithfully believes, that Pearl was not only alive, but married, and happy, and mindful of her mother, and that she would most joyfully have entertained that sad and lonely mother at her fireside, but there was a more real life for Hester Prynne here in New England than in that unknown region where Pearl had found a home. Here had been her sin, here her sorrow, and here was yet to be her penitence. She had returned, therefore, and resumed, of her own free will, for not the sternest magistrate of that iron period would have imposed it resumed the symbol of which we have related so dark a tale. Never afterwards did it quit her bosom, but, in the lapse of the toilsome, thoughtful, and self-devoted years that made up Hester's life, the scarlet letter ceased to be a stigma which attracted the world's scorn and bitterness, and became a type of something to be sorrowed over and looked upon with awe, yet with reverence too, and as Hester Prynne had no selfish ends, nor lived in any measure for her own profit and enjoyment. People brought all their sorrows and perplexities and besought her counsel, 
as one who had herself gone through a mighty trouble. Women, more especially, in the continually recurring trials of wounded, wasted, wronged, misplaced, or erring and sinful passion, or with the dreary burden of a heart unyielded, because unvalued and unsought, came to Hester's cottage, demanding why they were so wretched, and what the remedy, Hester comforted, and counseled them as best she might. She assured them, too, of her firm belief, that, at some brighter period, when the world should have grown ripe for it, in heaven's own time, a new truth would be revealed, in order to establish the whole relation between man and woman on a sure ground of mutual happiness. Earlier in life, Hester had vainly imagined that she herself might be the destined prophetess, but had long since recognized the impossibility that any mission of divine and mysterious truth should be confided to a woman stained with sin, bowed down with shame, or even burdened with a lifelong sorrow. The angel and apostle of the coming revelation must be a woman indeed, but lofty, pure, and beautiful and wise, moreover, not through dusky grief, but the ethereal medium of joy, and showing how sacred love should make us happy. By the truest test of a life successful to such an end. So said Hester Prynne, and glanced her sad eyes downward at the scarlet letter. And, after many, many years, a new grave was delved, near an old and sunken one, in that burial ground beside which King's Chapel has since been built. It was near that old and sunken grave, yet with a space between, as if the dust of the two sleepers had no right to mingle. Yet one tombstone served for both, all around. There were monuments carved with armorial bearings, and on this simple slab of slate as the curious investigator may still discern, and perplex himself with the purport there appeared the semblance of an engraved escutcheon. It bore a device, a herald's wording of which might serve for a motto and brief description of our now concluded legend. So somber is it, and relieved only by one ever-glowing point of light gloomier than the shadow,